Ladies and gentlemen, goeiemiddag, dames en heren, du melang, bon me li bon tate. It is wonderful. It is day three of our online engineering week, and I am so excited about what we are going to talk to you about today. So what's nice, and I've realized this, is that this engineering week, this online engineering week, is different to previous events as it is online. And it's so wonderful to see the enthusiasm, to see the questions. And I, again, I would like to invite you, if you have any questions as we go along, please feel free to post those questions in the chat function of YouTube. Um, dames en heren, as daar enige vraag is gedurende vandagse sessie, moet nie huiver om die vraag te plaas in die chat funksie van, van YouTube nie. So, uh, vanmiddag het ons twee gasten by ons saam in die atelier, het voel al soos uh, uitsending, en uh, eerstens het ons vir professor Leenta Grobler, en voordat ek gaan kom by die, by die vraag wat ek vraag het, Will I ask Prof. Lienta, would you please just introduce yourself? Just who are you? Um, and because we are dealing with, with prospective students, what route did you take with regards to studying and, and what are you currently doing? Um, tell us a bit about yourself. Okay. I'm Lienta Grobler and I am a computer and electronic engineer that came from Wurschel Waterkloof and I studied. Um, for four years I, uh, on my undergraduate degree um, that was in computer and electronic engineering, like I mentioned. And then I went on to complete my master's degree in computer engineering. And I did that with, a, or both those degrees I did with a bursary from Telcom. So I focused all my attention on telecommunication and the applications thereof in South Africa. And then while I was working on my master's degree, I realized that I really have a big interest in teaching people and reaching students in a way that I was not able to be reached as a student. So I was quite frustrated as a student because I felt like I had a lot of um, lecturers that didn't, it seemed at times as if they weren't interested in the um, subject. Um, I can say that now because all of them have left since. But um, I, was, I wasn't the best of students if you were to look at the academic record at that stage. And I, while I'd finished in four years, I really felt that I wish that someone would explain engineering to me in a way that I could understand. And that's why I decided to become a lecturer and to be that lecturer that doesn't only focus on the academic achievers, but on the general student that maybe do not want to learn everything from a book. So I was fortunate enough to be appointed at that stage as a lecturer. Um, I had the opportunity to complete my PhD in engineering development and management. And that um, is something that at the time made a lot of sense because it was in research management and getting to know the research environment at a university. So it wasn't necessarily technical, it was a qualitative study, but it gave me the tools that I needed to be able to work with a multidisciplinary team. But during this time, I stayed um, on and working uh, within the Telenet research group that focuses on telecommunication networks and applications. and while I was very, very interested in enjoying the, the telecommunication research, at the back of my mind, my interest that I had before, even before studying engineering in health-related issues and um, applications that could change people's lives in the healthcare sector stay, stayed a nagging issue. So I had a lot of final year project students under me um, working on various applications of medical device development. And then about three years ago, I took the leap and started focusing on medical applications of my telecommunication skills. So now I have established a um, platform for medical device development at the university. And we focus on Internet of Things, IoT applications. So yes, some of our, our applications is mechanical in nature and it might be 
and assistive aid um, to to do some form of exercise, like um, our new hand device that does exercises for people that suffered a stroke, or it is monitoring of devices that are um, in clinics. Um, so it is a very broad space where I apply my telecommunication skills now, and I really love my job. Thank you very much, Lienta Bai. Thank you. A month full also. Um, <laughs> and as a part, I have to talk with Will Terwille from the from the problem and students will have all. So, who in the university work and I can specific engineers be as for will be used. You do your BA in. This is a four year grad. Daarna kan jy voortgaan en jy kan jou M in doen. Jy kan hom in een jaar doen, is jy hard werk, maar hy is een jaar na twee jaar. So dan het jy jou M in, jou meestersgraad in ingenieurswese. Daar is nie een honneurs in ingenieurswese. Jy kan een nagraadse diploma doen, dit bestaan, maar mys doen een vier jaar graad, jou honneurs is ingesluit in die vier jaar. Dan doen jy jou meestersgraad, een jaar of twee, en daarna kan jy jou PAD doen, een PAD, is a doctor's grad, dan krijg jy een ander titel, a doctor, maar sy is a professor, Lenta, jy is a professor, want as jy nou lang genoeg werk, en baie navorsing doen, nadat jy dit a doctor is, dan word jy aangestel as a professor. Nou, dit is professor Lenta Grobler, wat hier so saam met ons vandag gesels. Nou, soos jy kan hoor, Lenta het a groot passie gehad, vir ook die veld van medies, die mediese wereld. So, ons het a raakvlak tussen ingenieurswese en medies, en dis specifiek waar ons vandag gaan praat. En Lenta, you have been awarded as lead of your team. You have been awarded. I'm going to read this because it's a very long award. So I'll read it to, to, the, to the viewers. The International Award from the COVID-19 Innovation Challenge of the United Nations Africa Innovation and Investment Forum 2020. So I hear UN, I hear international, and it's with regards to COVID-19. Please tell us a bit about this award and what is behind this award. Well, this award was specifically for the category of contact tracing at the UN's um, COVID challenge. Um, most of the universities in the country really stepped up this past three months to work on solutions for the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, well, I'll speak about three of those today. The first one was now awarded um, this prize, and this was for the Chop Chop application. Now, the Chop Chop application is something that we developed for schools originally, while it's now really being taken up by businesses across the country too. So, as a parent and as an engineer that really hates it when things aren't efficient, um, we realized <laughs> during the lockdown that we, once we go back to reality, that we'll be required to do some screening on a daily basis. And knowing that at school and at most places where I go to at this stage, everyone still works with pen and paper, and you need to go and write those screening results down on a daily basis. And the problem with that, as a parent of a grade two, is that I know how cold Potchefstroom is, and going back to school and having him stand in those long queues outside of school when it's really, really cold is something I can't bear. And then to have them watch someone yell, maybe um, yell a, a screening result and someone else has to write it down or you tell the kid to remember his temperature by the time he gets to the front and he started playing or looking at the um, at the birds and the next minute he can't remember his reading it's something that will just waste time so we developed something that can automatically collect all of the screening data of the school that includes the temperature data whether or not um, we're issuing someone with a mask or, or, and whether they're wearing one. And then all of those questions, the screening questions of the Department of Health, um, do you, with, have you been in contact with someone with COVID-19 or do you have a cough? We record all of this information in less than 10 seconds per, per student or per user. 
and we then store this data automatically in the cloud and then we also automatically summarize and report that data for the school to use and to be able to report that to the Department of Education. So it started in the school space and it started because I'm a parent, but it is really now being used very widely um, at businesses, mines, restaurants. It's really heartwarming to see something that we really developed just because we wanted to help, that we're seeing people really making use of it. Lenta, so hierdie Chop Chop app klink vir my wonderlik. So met ander woorde, as ek jou, as ek jou recht verstaan, um, en dis my wonderlik, wat ek die, die, die dinge lees, dit word al by 97 skole geïmplementeer, recht oor Suid-Afrika, en dan is daar ook 10 bezighede, waarvan 2 restaurante is, wat ook al hiervan gebruik maak, en um, in die aard van die saak, die die, 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 die leerders kom by die school aan, en volgens hierdie stelsel, het elk een leerder dan een kaart waarop daar een QR-code op is. En dan zal die betrokken onderwijzer of die betrokken persoon wat die um, screening doen, zal dan met een Android phone, want als er een bepaalde app wat hulle dan aflaai, zal dan hierdie Android phone gebruik en dit dan scan hierdie QR-code as ek recht verstaan, en dan met een infrarood temperatuurmeter word die temperatuur dan geneem, maar dan Met die cellfoon, die selle cellfoon word dan gebruik om hierdie leesing wat op die temperatuurmeter is dan te, op die, niemand hoef getalle te onthou nie, en niemand skryf iets neer, en hy doen dit automatisch, en ja. dan moet jy net letterlijk sê, dra die persoon een masker ja of nee, en dan is ook een paar ander vir ons gaan nou by dit uitkom, en dan op die eind van die dag word dit alles na een centrale databasis in die wolk word dit opgelaai. En die schoolhoof, as ek jou recht kan verstaan, kan dan letterlijk met die druk van een knoppie volledig sê, hoeveel kinders is daar by die school, wat is hulle individuele temperature, en mm. wat ek ook opgetel het, is, en hier is my wonderlik, jy kan selfs gaan, en as jy sien Susan, of Mari, jy wil weet wat na lewe aan die gang is, kan jou baak klik, en dan kan jy profiel oor tyd sien, maar luister, hier is die temperatuur wat stuig, of sy was constant laag gewees, dit is veilig, en daai inlichting kan dan ook verskaf word aan die onderwijsdepartement, so dit nodig is. Ga gewoon net in termen van die vraag. Wat is een vraag behalwe die masker? Wat is een vraag, vraag jullie app vir die mens um, wat, wat, dit, wat dit kan doen? Um, wel, dit is die... Wacht, dat ek dan nou eers hier so stop om, vir, om met jou hierdie te, te deel. Um, ja. um, die vraag wat gevraag word, is die die ambtelike vraag wat op die departement van gezondheidse leisie is, um, wat gestandardiseer is recht dier die land, en wat ons al gesien het vir beide die mynwese, die gezondheidswese en, en die akademiese omgeving allemaal diezelfde is. So, dit is baie specifieke vraag oor jou afgelope 14 dae, um, om jou risiko te bepaal, en dan ook die vraag oor huidige symptome. En ja, ons neem dit dan vir elke persoon op een dagelijkse basis op. Die rede hoekom ons keer kwaad is gebruik, um, on, ons app kan ook, en ek, ek moet wel nou sê, ek het net voordat ons nou gesels het, het ek nou vir die eerste keer um, die iOS app is ek bezig om, om te gebruik. Die soos waar, hy is nou vir Apple Phone ook beskikbaar en ons wacht net vir, vir die link en dan sal hom dan beskikbaar maak op die, op die iStore sodra hy actief is. Um, maar vir volwassenes gebruik ons een normale streepjeskode ID, dit kan die boekie weergave of die kaartie weergave wees, wat ons dan gebruik om iemand te identificeren. so enige besoekers of mense wat ons nie vooraf kan registreer, nie kan ons op die manier gaan hanteer. Maar kinders in onder 16 het nie ID document nie, en daarom moes ons een manier kry waar ook ons hulle vinnig identificeer, omdat ons nie die streepjeskode ID het nie. So, um, ons gebruik dit dan, joh, jy meld aan by die, by die uh, screening point, um, ek weet nie om, op, op, op die siftingspunt, en wanneer ons by die siftingspunt dan is, dan kan ons um, Die, die kind um, wel eerstens identificeer, en dan sodra ons geïdentificeerd het, kan ons dan ook die, um, 
die, die temperatuur meet, en soos jy sê, dan, ons gebruik die selfde camera, so ons gebruik automatische techniek, en zodra Henry na na baie kom, sal hy vir julle daar meer inlichting kan geef, oor precies hoe werk dit, want is oulike wiskunde wat ons gebruik, want ja, dit is nie net die app nie, allemaal kan die app maak, maar ons is in geneers wat die app gemaakt het, so ons het die wiskunde en die fysika gebruik, wat ons um, in ons graad en ons voorbereiding tot hier toe gekry het, om hierdie app te realiseer, en dus kom het so lekker voel om die app te gebruik, so um, wat ons doen is, ons um, identificeer die area van die digitale thermometer, ons identificeer waar is die vensterkie, en dan gaan kyk ons vir die 7 segment display, so daar waar ons um, die getalle uit die 7 streepiekies kan maak, om een 7 segment display te wees, gaan identificeer ons dan, en dan gaan lees ons automatisch daar die getalle uit die prentje uit. So die voordeel daarvan is, dat hier eens iemand kan nie verkeerd tik, of een foutie maak, en, um, en, en gegou 73 in plaas van 37 neerskryf nie, of ons gaan nie um, fake data intik, dier vir allemaal een lekker 36 koers te geef, want het is, het is lekker om het so te doen nie, so ons het een baie meer akkerate lezing, so die, die kans dat menselike foute inglip, um, is, is baie kleiner, en het maak die data baie meer akkerate, wat neer geskryf word. I love about this, it's, it's a reliable way of getting the information, That that's the first thing, and it's available. Um, a question I have, some of the schools have now implemented this, how much time do you save? It's, it's like a very mock ad now, so how much time can you save if you use this app, this Chop Chop app that you have developed? Well, according to the users that have um, shared their results with us and I think we should take note that it is primary school so it's both primary school teachers that are generally maybe afraid of technology on the one end and on the other end it is children that are much less disciplined than their, their matric counterparts so at this stage um, at Crane Park Law School in Secunda they were able to tell me that um, they could um, screen an entire grade seven group, and I think they have about 300 grade sevens. They could handle them with only two teachers in 10 minutes time each morning, and that was in the first week of using it. So it was even before they were really used to using the app. Um, they, are, they are so overwhelmingly positive about this. And in the um, businesses that have implemented this, uh, and it was an accountant that shared the information with me, so he's very specific and he is very critical. And he said that his um, staff now takes a third of the time on screening each morning than they usually did each day. This is wonderful. So you, you save time. You, you spar time. Je hoef nie nie buiten in die winter in die koude te staan, wat in elk geval nie goed is vir gezondheid om in die koude te blij nie. Ons kan vinnige groepe processeer en, en ons kan het daar doen. Uh, Leenta, wat my opgewonde hier oor maak is, hierdie is een baie, baie goeie voorbeeld van hoe een geneerswese prakties uh, gestalte kry. En dit het by die NBE gebeur, dit het binnen die fakulteit en geneerswese by die NBE en potje stroom, dit is wat het gebore is. Maar wat ek hou hiervan is, dat is een weeselike probleem probleemoplossing en ons kom met die oplossing voor een dag. En dit is my een klassieke voorbeeld. As iemand wil weet wat by hels in geneers wees, daar is een probleem, dit moet op een creatieve wijze opgelost word. And that is exactly what engineering entails. We are solving problems, making the world a better place. And, and with this Chop Chop app, you've done brilliantly. Um, just as a matter of curiosity, what other schools can you name that are currently on the list? Just perhaps a shout out to some of those schools. I know there are 97, but who are currently making use of this? Okay, I can, um, just the ones that I've signed up, so the others might have signed up that I don't know personally, but I know um, Law School Moirevier, Law School Bailey Park, um, Law School in Malfik, Botsoka High School in Ikaging, um, Law School, School Mariefel, Jun and Alderton, um, ja, daar is nou vijf vir jou wat ek vinnig kan onthou. Fantastisch, dankie Leenta. Natuurlijk weet ek, daar is dan een vraag, twee vraag wat mense sal vraag. Die eerste vraag, 
van jullie wonderlijke pakket. <laughs> Hoe werkt het? Wat kost het? Mensen wil weten wat kost het. How much does this thing cost? How much will it cost them to implement this at their, at their school? So we were adamant that we didn't want to, to put people, uh, and I say people because this includes the schools, where many parents stopped paying school fees while they were homeschooling their children, and small businesses like hair salons and um, I can't think of another one now, but small businesses that now need to record this data on a daily basis and they haven't had received an income for a very long time. So um, if it cost us nothing to, to do this, then we could have given it away for free, but unfortunately I had to pay people to assist me to do this. Um, so for a, the really small amount of uh, a once of registration fee of 200 rand and then a monthly admin fee of 20 rand, most small schools, those schools of um, 200 pupils or less and businesses that need to screen 200 people or less will be able to be served. So once of 200 rand and then 20 rand a month. And then thereafter, um, it is a differentiated package where for schools, we know exactly who we're going to screen on a daily basis. We have all of them registered. So we ask, the, uh, ask them a set fee per student for the entire um, month. And that is then for between um, number 201 and 1,000. So for the next 800 students, we ask them one rand per student per month. And then after that, we ask them for the remainder of their school, um, 50 cents per person per month. And then for the business sector, we have different offering where we don't know who we will be scanning. We haven't registered the people beforehand. And um, specifically for the restaurant sector, we have we had to make a lot of changes so that we can make it easier for patrons to register beforehand. So that's something that we're launching this weekend that you can register on our site before going to a restaurant and when you get to the restaurant you don't have to touch a single paper you just take your pass with you and it already has your address and everything and you scan into the restaurant so for the business sector we then have an offering where we say we charge you 35 cents per scan um, and that's if you have to scan the same person twice a day it will count as count as two scans per day, but then again, so it will be free for the first 200 scans, but then thereafter it will be 35 cents up until 20,000 scans, and then thereafter it is 20 cents per head, and then we hit a, a certain ceiling where it becomes free. This is wonderful. It is wonderful. So as I get finished, I'm going to go to so the small the 200 rand ongeacht die grootte van jou school, dit hoor ek, en dan as jy klein school is, tot en met die eerste 200, so as jy 200 kinders in jou school het, beteken dit eenmalig 200 rand, dan het jy toegang tot die totale pakket, en dan is dit 20 rand per maand, tussen 200, so 200 in 1 tot 1000, is dan 1 rand per, per persoon per maand, wat dan nou bykom, en dan boe 1000 is dit 50 cent per additionele persoon uh, per maand wat dan bykom. En dan vir die bezighede, klein bezighede is dit, maar wat ek, wat ek hou van al van dit, jy sê oor die bezighede, betekent dit, ek wat argument sondal wil vanavond, wil naar een restaurant toe gaan, ons vier, of ons hoeveel ook al wat gaan, kan dan nou voor die tijd ons inlichting invoer, ek hoef nie by die restaurant papiere in te vul nie, ek hoef nie daar te staan, en goed is te tik nie, dis letterlik, kom daar aan, jy het pas, jy, jy, jy sign in en dit is een temperatuurmeting, dit word automatisch gelees en dit is daar. En die bedraas in elk van minimaal, relatief ja. tot wat het jou nou gaan kost vir die, vir die, vir die, vir die ete wat jy gaan heen. But this is phenomenal. So, this is one example of how engineering is helping with this whole COVID-19 process to just be a bit more productive, to be a bit more efficient, whether it's in the school system or whether it is in the the, the uh, professional sector where, where people are working. But what's nice about this, this is an example of how engineering is assisting the world of medicine. Mm -hmm. Well, this is not the only 
thing we're going to talk to about about this this afternoon. So Leanta, there's there's another another trick up your sleeve. But once again, it was for this app that you received this international award from the UN Africa. Am I right? Right. So we will continue then. What is the the, the second thing that that you have to show us? Okay. So. This was actually the very first thing that I spent a lot of my time on during the first portion of this year. And I wonder why it's doing that. In any case, you can now see a flashy version of, <laughs> of this um, Birdmark 8 respirator. So I'm going to stop sharing for a moment um, just to so that it doesn't distract you too much. Well, what makes this a phenomenal piece of engineering is that this specific technology comes from the Second World War, and it was developed by a guy named, um, named Dr. Bird. He was both an engineer, a doctor, and a, a pilot. And just after the, the iron lung was um, used to, to keep soldiers alive, he came up with this technology that needs no electricity and it can give um, exactly the same results as our modern uh, ventilators. Now, how ventilation works is that your lung is, or, or the human body stays amazing. So when you breathe, it is not like a balloon like that you're blowing up. It is the, the muscles between your ribs that contract and expand. And when they do that along with your diaphragm, when that happens, it creates a vacuum. And when there's more space in, your, in that cavity, your lung inflates. And when they contract again, the lung deflates. So that is why you will read a lot about ventilation and how harmful it is to the human body, because ventilation and why you want to avoid a ventilator in general, because a ventilator typically inflates and deflates your lung like a balloon, and it's not supposed to work that way. But when it's really for um, tough times and we have no other option, then we have to do it. And um, so what's nice about this guy is that he can, uh, it can be used in both a setting where we have um, we need constant positive airway pressure, or it can be used in a manual setting where it has to inflate and deflate the lung. Um, but like I said, it requires no electricity and it's a really awesome piece of equipment. But they stopped using these guys about 20 years ago. And when the pandemic struck, um, we got calls from all over the world telling us that you need to go and look at this piece of equipment because it just worked, and I phoned Seigerberg Hospital and Fredeski Hospital, and they actually found some in their um, museums. And they sent, they packaged them up, and they sent us, them to us, and we were then able to put these exact machines in the same CT scanner that um, would typically be used to scan a human body. Now, the human body is usually made up of, or is, is, is always <laughs> made up of mostly water. So um, while a human can be scanned in a matter of minutes, um, something like this and the, the central part being um, die cast aluminium, it took about a week in the CT scanner. And a CT scanner will take a lot of small photos of the body and then use that to build up a, a model. And what's now really awesome is that with the help of the Vol University of Technology, the Central University of Technology, and NEXA, we were able to scan this machine and then build 3D models of these machines. And now with these 3D models, we could, and I wish I could show you the inside of this, this white version now is actually a 3D ver printed version of the bird that we scanned. And we were able to unify 13 different parts inside that are now printed as a single unit that usually would have been 13 different parts 
from different manufacturers that need to be integrated and assembled. And so this made it possible for us to now uh, manufacture one of these in, in a single facility in a much shorter time than we would actually be able to do if we were to do it in the traditional way. And it costs a lot less money than it would do would if we were to use the same techniques they used 30 years ago. Lenta, that is phenomenal. That is net baanbrekers werk om hulle besig is om op die eind van die dag met 3D drukkers uit die aard van die saak hierdie ventilators te kan produseer waar al so groot aanvraag voor is, gegewe die pandemie, en dat die 3D drukker maak alles waar al 13 verskillende parte is, daar het jy een ventilator wat nou, wat nou mooi kan functioneer. So, so dit is wonderlik. So, Leenda, dit het wel nie gestopt net by die ventilator nie. Daar is een additionele deel aan die ventilator, wat ons nou weer terugvat, weer in die wereld van rekenaar elektronische ingenieurswese. Ek hoor graag van jou. Ja, ek um, sien um, Dr. Henry Marais het intussen by ons aangesluit. So, ek het nou al verskrikkelijk baie gepraat. So, ek dink, um, Cornelis, wil jy nie daar bykie vir Henry vraag? Right, so, yes, uh, Dr. Henry Marais, also a lecturer within the Faculty of Engineering at the Northwest University. He is also part of this bigger team. And um, so, Henry, welcome. We've uh, just discussed the Chop Chop app, and we have uh, also now, you've, you've heard Lienta talking about the, the ventilator. So, we just, the, the question for you, first of all, just introduce yourself. What is the, from where are you originally? And what, what is the path that you took to get where you are now? And then we will delve into the Chop Chop app and the ventilator and what else? All right, well, um, as, as, as you know, well, you know my name by now, so we'll skip that part. But um, yeah, I, I grew up in a, in a town not far from Potchefstroom in uh, Orkney and, and Clarkstalk, which is pretty much mining towns. And um, you know, throughout school, I was pretty much interested in, in computers and was pretty much dead set on becoming a computer programmer for a long time. And at a whim, sort of signed up for, and at that time, it was called a, uh, it, it was, was the equivalent of engineering week, but it was for special people and you were invited. And so we did that. And it was sort of fun. And um, so, blog. Long story short, I sort of abandoned and then uh, thought, well, radio seems cool, so I did a master's degree in radio. And uh, once that was done, it's, it, it's a case of uh, I spent a while doing consulting projects and that sort of thing in the, in the radio space and sort of grew tired of it since it's all of the same thing over and over again. Same equation, same designs, just different sizes. Um, and then I started my PhD in a field that's now been called um, automatic identification. The idea was to train machines to diagnose industrial plants. So like you would go to the doctor with a little cough and the doctor would say, well, maybe you've got the flu or these days probably corona. Um, yeah, I, I started off with the idea, well, I could maybe teach a computer to do that for petrochemical plant. Um, and it proved to be a significant challenge. Uh, but I, I managed to, to get a PhD for it. So at least some people in the world think that I got closer to an answer. Um, and throughout this sort of academic journey, I became the undergrad program manager for computer engineering um, and also mechatronic engineering now. Um, at the School of Electrical and Electronic Engineering. So that in a nutshell is, is pretty much where I'm from and, and what I do. Uh, primarily I label myself as a computer engineer. So I still like the programming stuff uh, a lot um, and, and spend a lot of time doing that. But the engineering side of it brings additional challenges and opportunities to, to apply things. So I, I hope that addresses your sort of introduce yourself thing. Baie dankie, Henry. Nou, in die aard van die saak, weet ons wie hy is. En vir allemaal daar buiten, weer eens, dokters graag. So, dit is B ing is vier jaar, M ing is een of twee jaar, en dan een PAD, dat dit wissel. 
Um, interessant. Ja, nee, ek denk mense wat PAD is het, of wat al aangepak het in hun leven, sal weet wat is die humor achter daar die sin. Maar in elk, hy is een dokter, hy nie een medische dokter nie, een dokter in ingenieurswese. Um, Henry, the follow-up question um, that I have, um, so Lienta has, has talked about the Chop Chop app, and she's talked about the practicalities behind it. We even did the whole marketing of it uh, for, for schools who are interested in getting the app um, for themselves. We'll get to the contact details a bit later. Lienta, you must, you must remind me. Um, but the question we have with regards to the Chop Chop app, with regards to the ventilator, what is the programming part behind it, the, the, the part that, that you are the boffin on, where you are the expert on? Um, as a chemical engineer, don't, I, I don't understand those things, but uh, please tell us a bit about that side. All right. Um, I think it's, it's two different things. So let's do the, the Chop Chop app first. Um, I, I suppose it's all in the name. It's an app with an associated website. So all things programming goes into it. Um, you have some programming that takes place in a on the Android side in a Java environment, and that's then transmitted with a host of web technologies to a, a database in the back end that's sort of hidden from the user. And there's a nice website where the users can then you know, make payments, see the data, and all those sort of things. So that entire ecosystem is, is where programming plays a role. Um, but I'd say that the average sort of IT competent person would be able to accomplish that. Where the engineering side of things for, for Chop Chop sort of rises to the fore, is specifically with regards to how we automatically obtain the temperature reading from the thermometer. So the thermometers that's used, they sort of look like a little plastic gun. And there's nice science behind it, but it uses infrared light to estimate a temperature. And this temperature is then displayed to the user on a, on a screen with that um, typical digital font, the, the really blocky sort of combination of little stripy segments. We call those things seven segments, seven segment displays, uh, purely for the reason that there's seven segments to make a number. And uh, there's a few twists, but uh, generally there's a combination for zero through nine. Um, Certain fonts have two versions of a six and two versions of a nine. And we use image recognition um, to automatically identify the region of interest. So the user points it at the screen of the thermometer. And we use a bunch of math to figure out where the individual digits of the number is. So if you consider a human temperature, it will typically be two digits and one decimal value. Um, so 36.4 degrees Celsius, for instance. So we need to get the computer to understand, or, or the smartphone in this case, to understand where is this digit located. And once you've figured out where the digit is located, you need to get the information from the image and then somehow identify the digit. Now, most of the image recognition world these days tend to favor machine learning or so-called AI. So everybody likes the AI thing. And what's really interesting about these seven segment displays is that none of the six or seven AI toolboxes that I tried could actually identify a seven segment digit. You could feed it handwritten text and it can recognize it, no problem. You can feed it typed text and it will recognize it, no problem. But you can feed it the best seven segment sample you can find. You can even generate a seven segment sample programmatically, and it still fails. So there's a bunch of cool math and image processing techniques that sort of goes into it to actually allow your phone to identify a digit. Um, and what makes it really cool is we do this without the addition of the internet. So you could pretty much go to I don't know, middle of the Karoo, they're close to the, the SKA site where there's no cell phone coverage, and it will still work. Um, so I think that's, for, for Chop Chop at least, that's the sort of the really juicy bit of the engineering stuff that, that's hidden from view and appears as if it's magic if it works. Right. 
Thank you very much for that, Henry. So as you have been now listening, and you can at least follow what Henry has said, then I will advise you that you are now a Reek naar Electronics Engineer in Wording. Because it's it's resonated with your brain. If you don't understand it, then you have to the rest of the week and follow the week to find out what the Engineers are doing for you. Henry, before we go to the next part of the ventilator, I have a first question that on YouTube is, as a brief as you have a question, the question that was asked, what programming languages would you recommend to people who are interested in developing their own projects? What is Rekenartal? Neem ek aan. Sal jy aanbeveel vir mens wat belangrik, wat belangstel daan om hulle eie projekte te ontwikkel? Met gerig op kinders wat op school is, wat sal jy voorstel? Well, it's an interesting question, since my, my short answer is nothing, not a single computer programming language. Um, what I would do is, if, if you look at computer programming languages, it's a way of telling a machine how to do things. And if you can distill a problem into certain steps, so fundamentally a computer is a pretty stupid thing. It, it cannot think for itself. All that it can do is it can do some sums, so a little bit of math, plus and minus, pretty much, uh, some division and multiplication. It can do that really quickly and really fast and a lot of times without getting tired. But, but that's one part of it. It can get some input from a user and provide some output to you. So, and it can make a decision between either zero or one. So fundamentally, any computer is distilled to that four operations. So input, output, branching, deciding between zero and one, doing stuff over and over and over again, and doing some math in between. That, that's it. So rather than trying to figure out what the na next magic computer language is, learn yourself that sort of skill to say, well, I've got a problem. I want to find out what's the maximum amount of boxes I can fit into a container, arguments say. And if you can write down on a paper, then you can find the computer language that's uh, suitable for the task. Case in point, for the chop chop thing, we've worked with probably close on 12 different languages, depending on where in the application you, you're sort of working at. So there's no one size fits all. The one size fits all is computer programming at its core is thinking and logic. Henry, maar ek gaan nog steeds daai persoon wees. So, jy gaan vir my moet, geef vir my twee of drie tale, wat tenminste sal help. Ek hoor wat jy sê, oor die holistische benadering, maar as jy, kom ek vraag aan so, wat sal jou drie ginsteling tale wees, wat jy denk, tenminste daai drie. As jy net drie tale kon kies, Wat sal daar drie tale wees? Kom, ek maak, ek maak, ek stel my vraag anders. May I amend your question? No, you must keep to the lines I'm putting there. But okay, amend, but at least I want an answer in the end. I'll give you three languages, but they won't be my favorites. My favorite languages would probably be C, Java, and Python at this point in time. Of which C is horrendously complex to learn, and it will break you rather quickly if you start learning it. At this point in time, Python seems to be the flavor of the month. It's easy to learn. It's free. Uh, you can download all the tools you need. There's a lot of stuff online. So if you if you want to get your sort of dip your toes in the water, I'd say go with a Python thing. Um, but guard against learning a language and sort of try to get the logic behind it. Since the logic behind it will give you tools that will translate even if Python is no longer available or around. Thank you very much, Henry. I, 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 I will then, the answer is Python. That, that's what I take. But I, I hear There's what an you asterisk say. behind it. <laughs> of course, of course. There's another question that came through from Mr. T's time. Um, the question from the floor. One, um, does it take, what does it take for one to be a good programmer? Wat vat het, wat is nodig, jy het bykie al daan geraak, maar wat vat het om een goeie programmeerder te wees? What does it take to be a good programmer? Well, first off, you need to be able to get at the problem logically. So that's step one. 
Um, but that assumes that you live in an ideal world and everything goes according to plan, um, which it rarely does. So I'd say together with your logic toolbox, um, a lot of tenacity and an eye for detail since um, spaces and decimal points make a big difference um, in, in a computer language. And it might be the difference between it works or it does not work at all. Um, but there's more sort of incipient sort of bugs that you introduce and they are difficult to find since they're not always the same. So it will work almost all of the time, but one or two times it will fail. And to figure out what's the exact cause of it and to fix it, that requires some really tenacious effort on the part of the programmer to actually fix that. So that, that would be my two main things, tenacity and eye for detail, and then obviously the logic stuff, but that goes without saying. Thank you very much, uh, Henry, for that answer. Mr. T's time, I hope that answered your question. If you have other questions, please feel free to ask them. Leenta, I hope you have your awesome trick again, because we're going to go back to you. When we start with the Chop Chop app, we've talked about the ventilators, Maar daar is nog een aspect wat ook weer eens wijst hoe die wereld van ingenieurswezen en die medische wereld bijna aan elkaar komt. Vertel ons alsjeblieft van die laatste aspect waar we ons gaan praten. Oké. Okay. Wel, terwijl ik zo met, die, zo met WUT en CUT gewerkt heb in die ventilatieproject, en ik zo so baie geleerd van die ventilatieproces, het, ek acht, het ons achtergekomen dat een groter beperkende factor in die wereld, nie net in Zuid-Afrika nie, is nie net wendig die hoeveelheid ventilators wat beskikbaar is nie, maar meer die hoeveelheid personeel wat behoorlijk opgeleid is, so um, ICU, kritische zorg, verpleegsters uh, specifiek. En daarom met ons begin kyk na hoe kan ons hulle hande lichter en meer maak, um, ons kan nie nou skielik mense toewer nie, maar weer eens kan ingeneers kyk, hoe kan ons dit wat reeds bestaan en technologie by mekaar uitdring, om te kyk hoe ons um, die, 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 die probleem kan oplos. So daarom met ons begin kyk na ventilatie monitering en specifiek gesien dat enig iets anders in een ICU omgeving word al reeds uh, of ka uit die potentiaal om reeds centraal gemonitor te word en op iwers nie netwendig by die patiënt self nie geobserveerd te kan word. Daar was enkele verskaffers um, en is gewoonlik jou heel dierste weergave van een ventilator wat vir jou een remote opsie gee, maar dit het, die probleem is dat jy daar nog steeds precies diezelfde selfde en model of fabrikaat en model ventilator nodig sal hee vir allemaal in jou hospitaal. So as jy verskillende set gaan slechts daar die wat aan die vereises voldoen gebruik kan word. En daarom met ons toe um, wel gekyk eerstens na techniek en tweedens na een um, stelsel waarmee ons die ventilators kan monitor en dit remotely of oor afstand beskikbaar maak vir mense om te kan of vir, vir verpleegsters om te kan kan gebruik. En um, ek gaan vir Henry vrou om vir ons bykie meer inlichting te gee oor hoe specifiek, hoe dit specifiek werk. Maar ek wil graag vir julle tenminste een prentjie wees van hoe lyk een ventilator. So ek gaan nog een keer hierdie screen sharing probeer. Kom ons kyk. En hoopelik gaan hierdie keer nie weer vir ons dans nie. Ok, so dit is hoe een typiese ventilator lyk. En hier is een prentjie van uit die um, patent wat ons specifiek ook geregistreer het vir hierdie techniek. En hierdie blokkiekie hierso <laughs> is waar um, Henry een sensor plaas wat ons dan gebruik om hier tussen die patiënt kan. En hier waar die ventilator kan is achter te kom wat gaan aan met die, die, die ventilator, so dat ons die inlichting beskikbaar kan maak oor een afstand. Um, so as ek nou hier terug gaan, na hierdie prentje toe, dan, hier is dit ook een goeie plek vir jou, om van hieraf 
with the cells. Right, just, just before we go to Henry, Henry, you can prepare what you want to say, just to recap at this point in time. So what you have developed is this monitoring system that, because if you put it on, if you hear ventilators, we need more ventilators. But th there are two aspects to the ventilator. You need the ventilator on the one side, but then you need a qualified ICU nurse specializing in ventilation, or ventilators, I assume it's that, to monitor these things. And this will then allow one person, one specialist to monitor a couple of people at the same time remotely. So On and games, we just lost you there for a moment, but we're back now. But that's that's life. Uh, apologies, but I, I I assume every single one of you have had this. You have a meeting, suddenly it stops. You have a class, and it suddenly stops. So it's unannounced, and we just lost streaming. But we're back online. So just to to recap, Lienta was talking about these ventilators and how they are remotely monitored, and that's wonderful because. Having a ventilator is one thing, but then you need a qualified person to be able to operate that ventilator. It's not just press a button and there you go. And the advantage of this remote monitoring system is we can actually protect our specialists. We can actually protect those people who have the knowledge of operating these ventilators. And remotely, one person will be able to monitor multiple ventilators and make adjustments and ask somebody to make these changes. Um, so I, I think that's a great thing. And I think it's in the best interest of, of everyone to, to have this available. So we're gonna talk now, Henry, you, you're gonna, so you had a take one, you're gonna have a take two now. So uh, oh, give us it. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, well, in, in take one, I, I'll assume that uh, nobody got take one except a few. Um, so in essence, what, what we're trying to do is we're trying to recreate the sort of Hollywood experience where you take an unqualified passenger on a plane and have the guy land the thing once the pilot is sort of incapacitated. Um, to make matters a little bit more complicated in, in that specific scenario, you can assume that your fleet of aircraft is not just a Boeing or an Airbus, it's an anything. And it might be a really old airplane. So think the first one that the Wright brothers came up with, or it might be a really new one, like the one, I don't know, the American military is developing, that F-29 or whatever it's called, and anything in between. So now it becomes a little bit more complicated since your ventilator in the hospital had a trained operator. So assume you had a qualified pilot for that specific ventilator. And typically, hospitals tend to be pretty brand royal, so they'll stick with the same manufacturer, but they'll buy different models. And these models are more or less the same. They have some new features, but in a pinch, you can use a person that's sort of used to an old model to operate a new one. If it's a real crisis, like the one we're facing now, then you end up with, well, we have to use what we can get our hands on. So no longer have you got the luxury to actually just buy certain brands. Now you've got a heterogeneous fleet. So you've got old devices, new devices, devices that you've never used before. And A, you don't have operators for each of those devices. And B, you need a person that's sort of 
qualified in terms of monitoring or interpreting the vital signs of the patient to make the adjustment. So it, it's a double-sided problem. Keeping the patient ventilated um, is, is sort of a, let's call that the technical problem. And then there's the medical problem of actually providing ventilation in such a way as to not harm the patient further. So where our solution sort of fits in is obviously more towards the technical side of things, uh, but it enables the medical side of, of the monitoring problem. So um, as I said, we have uh, a heterogeneous fleet. So that's pretty much a, a mix of various different ventilators in the same hospital. It might even be the same room in the same hospital. So you, you have a bunch of these machines. Um, you spoke about the bird earlier, and that thing is pretty much mechanical. So no nice touch screen interface there. You've got pretty much knobs, and that's it. And we need to find a way to be able to make those bird ventilators more intelligent, okay, since they've got nothing. But we also need to make the, let's call it the bird plus 20 years model, a little bit more interesting, since the so-called Internet of Things even though it's been with us for a long while, um, it is not something that you'll find in typical medical equipment. Um, medical equipment tends to be very highly regulated, and we do not want any experimental features in those things. So even though Internet of Things technologies have existed for close on 20 odd years, it's not found its way into many devices that you'll see in a typical hospital. Even the devices that uh, Lenta alluded to earlier that provides this monitoring capability, um, that's pretty much localized to the ICU itself. So just to provide a centralized display with all of the information on it within the ICU, which still, it helps a little bit, uh, but not too much. And in terms of ventilators, um, only the really, really expensive ones have this sort of thing. and Initially, I thought, well, that's pretty stupid. Why not just put in the technology? But it makes actual sense that if I need a medically qualified person to operate the thing, mm -hmm. and the person would be would need to be in close proximity to the patient to make the adjustments anyway, there's no need to send the information across large distances. Um, but rather around the pandemic and everybody sort of gets rid of a lot of preconceived notions. And what we've now done is um, I've devised a way where you can, with a single sensor, so you don't need to buy lots of sensors, you can use one sensor and you can insert this thing between the ventilator and the patient. So there, there's a piece of plastic pipe running from the ventilator to the patient. And we insert a sensor into that pipe to determine the characteristics of the mechanical ventilation. So. Um, typically, these machines provide a certain volume of flow at a specific pressure. So that's stuff you you understand, Cornelius. So it, it's stuff in a pipe kind of thing. Um, so we interpret the, the sensor data, and then we build a graphical display. So we, we construct a picture um, on a, let's call it a, a PC screen for, for now, but it could be a phone screen or something else as well. Um, that we show the qualified operator a graph of what's going on. And in essence, we've then sort of upgraded the bird to have some electronic um, output, but we've also upgraded all of the other things in between uh, to, to gather the same data. And what's nice is since this will work for a heterogeneous fleet of devices, even if you were in the lucky position to have the really fancy machines, now you have a single display for all machines displayed to the operator. And there's, there's some value in showing a person 16 different patients in the same view versus showing them 16 different views of 16 different patients. So, so the cognitive load required to interpret the data is much less. So even if you had the fancy ones, it still makes sense to sort of at at some level homogenize the output from the machines, and um, that that's essentially where it plays into. So on the one hand, there's an algorithmic side of it, 
to, to handle this automatic diagnosis aspect. And then there's the Internet of Things stuff to actually make it work. Um, but you won't, you could do the Internet of Things side of, of, of stuff without the algorithmic side of it. But I don't know what you'll send along since you'll need to be able to process the data. Just showing a person that's used to seeing uh, a graph of a heartbeat, showing them raw signal data, a bunch of numbers scrolling by, a lot of the matrix sort of screen, that's not going to work. So there needs to be some translation in between. Bye, thank you, Henry. Nice. Baie interessant, maar het is interessant hoe hierdie wereldde by mekaar kom, en ek het een laatste vraag vir jou aan die einde wat ek gaan vraag. Ek het om al voorheen vir jou gevraag, maar ek gaan omhou oor die wereld van medies en die wereld van ingenieurswees, maar ek, ek los om verlater. Als eerste paar vraag van die vloer, um, Marita Aljaar, baie goeiemiddag. Marita Aljaar wil weet, dat jy sê Delphi is een goeie rekenaarprogram, en dan sommige gaan ek vir jou die ander vraag ook gee van Adrian Grobbelaar af, wat er IDE Integrated Development Environment, denk ek, is my die idee. Waar is punt of vir? Ons chemische ingenieurs kan ook sekere goeders aflui. So wat er IDE, sou jy sê, is beter om te begin programmeer? J-Grasp of Delphi? So the two questions, is Delphi a good computer program? And if you look at the IDE, the Integrated uh, Development Environment, um, what is better to start with, J-Grasp or Delphi? So that's a bit of technical questions. Um, not specifically related to what you just said now, but uh, yeah, Henry, that's for you. Um, well, I, I've not used Delphi in, gee, I, I last used it when I was in matrix, so I had to do some math. Uh, let's call it 15, 20, uh, 20 odd years ago. So, so I've not played with Delphi in recent times. So e expressing my opinion on, is it a good language, seems a bit <laughs> unfair to, towards the language. Um, <laughs> But I think my earlier comments would hold. Any language that gets the job done is a good one. Um, you can obviously use it in a bad way, um, but if it gets the job done, then and you're skilled in using it. So as an engineer, there's always this trade-off. Do you use the latest and greatest tool that you're not familiar with, or do you use a slightly older tool, but you're really an expert? And, and I'd sort of be bias towards going with using what you know and you're the expert in, rather than going with the latest, greatest, newfangled thing. Um, so, so, but, so that would be my answer to the Delphi side. Maar, so dit, wat, wat goed is, so wat ek eerstens hoor, is ongeacht wat er taal jy leer, is goed om uit taal te leer, want het is een sekere denkproces wat ontwikkel word. So dit is daar. Maar dan aan die andere kant, dit hang af, dit hang af, uh, wat is die omstandighede. <laughs> Maar ek gaan wel die vraag dan vloog. As with most as things in engineering, it depends. Yes. As, as jy geen taal op hierdie storm van die gevecht ken, en jy moet kies tussen J-Grasp en Delphi, jy begin van scratch af met ander woorde, wat er een sal jy wel aanbeveel? Well, Delphi is a language and J-Grasp is an IDE, so it's apples and oranges. Okay. I don't understand these things in any way. I, I hope, Adrian, I hope you understand what this means, apples and, and limoen. Okay, but I can't ask a question. I can't ask a question. Between the development of the environment, is it the same as with the talk? If you're used to the environment and it works for you, go with it. So, but you don't have to look at the environment. So, if the environment doesn't work, you don't have to look at it. Thank you. Voorbeeld dat net noem, um, Henry het al baie vir my gelag te oor, maar precies vir jy self te rede verstaan nie, hoekom ek het doen. My area van kindigheid is user experience design. Um, en dis waar ek inkom wanneer ons hierdie toepassing specifiek vir kliente wat glad nie ingeneers is nie bou. So, hy het vir my al soveel gelag dat as ek enige kese vir baie lang gehad het, van waar ek vinnig user interface aan mekaar gaan sit, het ek het in PowerPoint gedoen, wat is my so vinnig. Dit is nie die rechte tool om dit te doen nie, en dit is verseker nie, dan het ek nog een jylle stap voor ek begin by implementering uitkom, maar ek het so vinnig in die omgeving my gedagtes by mekaar gekry het, en het so vinnig met die gebruiker getoets het, 
dat ik verraag jarenlang PowerPoint als mijn eerste. Ik heb alle grafische koppelplakken wat ik kon verkoopt eerst in PowerPoint gebouwd. En dan staan hij partij maar achter mij en zei, hoe weet ik daar in, in, in PowerPoint gedaan? Of weet ik dat gedaan? En dat is net omdat ik het zo so bij al gebruik het, dat het, dit is dus een tweede hand, of een extra hand, de derde hand. So diezelfde geld voor programmering oor jou gemeen, of enige iets wat je gaan doen. Als dit iets is wat jij meer gemakkelijk is, gaan je beter kan denken, en je gaat niet vastkijken in die frustraties van je weet nog niet om hier die stukje te doen. Dus het ook al jij de creatiefste kan wees en die beste kan denken, dat is waar je moet blijven. Zolang so als moeilijk voordat jij iets niets probeert kwijt te raken. Baie dankie Liam, wat daar maak, maak 100% sin. And, and, and I hope the answer is becoming clear to our viewers that it's not one size fits all, there's not a silver bullet. You have to do what's best for your circumstances and, and use that. But again, even behind that, it's a way of thinking. It, it's a way of approaching problems and solving those problems. The languages, the IDEs, all those things, they are just tools to, to get somewhere. But, but you need to first understand what the problem is, you have to clearly define that, and then you need to come up with an, a creative solution to that. Right. Um, for the people who are as you have a question, you have to ask us to answer. That can also be a general engineer, which I will answer. But Lenta, I will ask you to ask you. With the Chop Chop app, this is not the question, this is not the answer. If there are people who are there, who is important, that can be an older person, that can be an underwriter, that can be a school person, that can Ik moet hierdie inlichting in die handen krijgen. Ik moet weet wat hierdie bij ons. Of een ouder wat sê, my school of moet hiervan weet. Want morgen, morgen gaan ons school, chop chop, ons kinders inteken. Hoe kom hulle in aanraking? Wat is daar die contact besonderhede? Wel die beste is om na ons webblad te gaan, want daar is al die ander inlichting ook by gesit. So het is www.chop.com So Chop Chop soos Afrikaans, t j o p t j o p met een koppelteken, dot com. Ons het ook een redelijke levendige Facebook page, wat ook jy kan soek voor die te soek Chop Chop app. En um, as iemand graag met a, die geduldigste, vriendelijkste admin persoon in die hele wereld wil praat, dan kan hulle ons um, Louise Gertenbach per telefoon contact by 018 2994078 contact. Um, ons word gereeld gecomplimenteerd en hoe ongelooflike ervaring dit is om met al oor die foon te praat. En sy is ons bekaanse eie assistent wat vrijwilliglik ons help op Chop Chop, want Chop Chop is nie bezig het nie, Chop Chop is NWE en genees wees, so so allemaal wat kan help, maar ek dink as jy Zelfs al voel je nou net in je grindel tijd zo'n beetje alleen is dit een goede nummer om te schokken. Je gaat sommige beter voelen als je met al gesels het. So just to repeat those, those numbers, um, because it's a YouTube video, you can just go back and listen to it in Afrikaans. But you can either phone Louise Gertenbach, the assistant to the executive dean. Her number is 018, so that's Potchefstroom area code, 018 once you get to POTS, you'll know all the numbers at the university is 018299 and then 4078. 018299, 4078. And then two other options, either on Facebook, the Chop Chop app, you can search for that. And that's that's not the English Chop, it's the Afrikaans Chop. That's T J O P, Chop hyphen Chop, T A O P. So Chop hyphen Chop, and you can find also the webpage www.chop-chop.com Dit kom recht daar so leent af. Fantastisch. Dan kan jylle daar nou kyk. Chop chop. Yes. Chop chop, ons gaan nou braai. Want as jy tyd spaar, gaan jy vinnig in die braaifluis uitkom. Dit is, dit is wat ons hier so heet, by die chop chop app. Fantastisch. Henry, I have a question for you. Um, it, it's a final question in your direction. And I did ask you that on a previous occasion, and I liked your answer. That's why I'm asking you this question again. If we look at this now, we've talked about the Chop Chop app. We've talked about these 3D printed ventilators. We've talked about the interface and monitoring these ventilators. 
thinking about engineering on the one side and medicine on the other side, will there one day be a time when you will not be going to the doctor anymore, you'll be going to the engineer, where there will not be a need necessarily for doctors because the engineers will take over the world of, <laughs> of, of, of medicine? Uh -huh. Good question. <laughs> Um, yeah, Cornelius, my, my answer would be, and, and that was pretty much the gist of it previously as well. On the one hand, engineering has already sort of merged with medicine, um, but I do not think that engineering will supplant medicine at all. Um, and, and my reason for that answer is if you sort of use the analogy with aircraft, um, most of the commercial aircraft that you fly with between here and the US or from Joburg to Cape Town, those airplanes pretty much fly themselves. Um, they take off on their own, they land on their own, um, and they sort of fly by means of GPS coordinates. Yet, most of us, um, myself included, would probably not like it too much if you board the plane and there's this little computerized voice sort of blurping out that we'll be leaving in 10 minutes for Cape Town and there's not a pilot in sight. So I think there's a there's a certain humanity with regards to technology, which engineering, we can make the technology good, but we can never replace a human. So I think medicine is one of those things where the empathy of the practitioner plays a role. So yes, we can build fancy machines that can diagnose all sorts of horrible diseases, but you need a person to break the news to you. And once the machine breaks down, so earlier we had a little communication glitch this afternoon, and technology will always have that sort of issue, since we can't make anything perfect. You can get close, but not perfect. At least your doctor is trained to operate a scalpel by hand. So as long as he has his hand and he's got some, um, I forgot what the chemical is that feeds humans, but brain power, then you should be good to go. We can provide assistive technologies. But I want a guy that when all the assistive technology goes, goes pear-shaped, there's a power failure or an earthquake or some other odd thing happens. I want a guy who knows what's going on and understands the fundamentals. So just as with engineering, it's about understanding the fundamentals and thinking. We need people who understand the fundamentals of medicine. So physiology and all the other stuff. Um, so I think there's definitely sort of an interface where these two fields naturally combine, but to each his own. I, I don't think we'll ever replace the other side. I think that's a brilliant answer, but what it's, what it's nice about this is, is that we are seeing this happening over and over again. And if you look at just the things you came up with, um, with the Chop Chop app, the ventilator, the monitoring system, there is a huge demand for qualified engineers who is who are able to assist within the field of medicine to assist doctors so yes i'm i'm willing to accept the fact that there will not be necessarily a day soon where doctors will be replaced but what mm -hmm. i do feel strongly about is and i see this is that there are so many opportunities for bright students out there pursuing a career in engineering and applying the, the skills of solving problems within the field of medicine. And the two examples, the three examples we've looked at today, those are just three examples. There are many more, and we can continue at length discussing those things. I'm just quickly checking whether there are any final questions. I don't see any, but yes. So here we have come to the end of this afternoon. Baie dankie vir julle wat ingeskakel het. Thank you very much for joining us again this afternoon. Thank you very much to Prof. Lienta Grobler and Dr. Henry Marais for joining us also in studio today, as I like to say. But yes, so this was the introduction to our engineering week. Tomorrow, we are starting by focusing specifically on the various disciplines within engineering, all the programs being presented. So tomorrow, you cannot miss it. Tomorrow, we'll talk about chemical and mineral engineering. On Friday, we will be talking about mechanical engineering. So you cannot miss that. And then next week, we will go into the field similar to 
what was discussed today, computer electronic, electric electronic, industrial, mechatronic, and electromechanical. And each of these days, it's, it's really, it's wonderful. We are going to have a panel which is very representative. There will be academics, so the people actually presenting these degrees, um, teaching these, these degrees. Then we will have students which can give honest answers as to how do they experience the whole environment. But then, and this is unique, we will also have people from industry sitting with us in studio and giving us an overview of what the job actually entails outside. And what I can tell you is if everything works nice tomorrow, we will even have somebody joining us all the way from Germany. And that will be nice because this is what the electronic world, the internet world has now created. We can have people from all around the world tuning in. So more can you miss the more chemist engineers we are in on of Friday and the other mechanics engineers we are in the week the other disciplines. Gaan gerust na engineering punt in de i punt a c punt z a. Die inlichting sal daar so wees. Just click on engineering dot nw dot ac dot z a to find the information for the following live broadcasts we will have with regards to the engineering week. Thank you very much. Once again, bye bye. Thank you. I don't know if you more to see. Mag jylle a wonderlijke aand verder Goodbye and keep well, keep safe and keep healthy. Thank you very much.